All right, let's get started with some acid-base chemistry. This is one of my favorite topics discussed in the MCAT. So the passage starts off by saying, a student was asked to determine the identity of an unknown acid that was liquid at room temperature. Okay, so we're first, first thing we're going to do is we're going to highlight that liquid at room temperature. That might be important. Um, and room temperature is, it says, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, so you don't have to memorize that for the exam. Okay, and the student was told that the acid is one of, one of the ones that were listed in table one. Okay, so you have four acids li listed here. Um, so just a cursory examination, we can see that right off the bat, two of these are going to be solid at room temperature. So oxalic acid, the melting point is 101, and cratonic acid, the melting point is 71.6. So at 20 degrees Celsius, neither of these will have been really melted, right? So it's probably not even cratonic or oxalic, but let's continue with the problem. Okay, so it says the student added 0.22 grams of the acid to 30 milliliters of H2O, so it's just a dilution, and then the student titrated the solution with 0.1 molar NaOH while monitoring the pH with a pH meter. The results are summarized in figure one. Okay, so this is a classic acid-base titration curve. Uh, looks like, you know, weak acid, strong base, and we know that because the equivalence point is above pH 7. So if it were strong acid, strong base, the equivalent point would be exactly at pH 7, but it's slightly above that. We can see it's probably around 8, which would make it a weak acid, strong base, which is you know, what's described here. Okay. Another point to notice is that it looks like this is a, a monoprotic acid because we only get you know one uh, half equivalence point, and then we get the equivalence point, and then we're all the way up at uh, a high pH. Okay, so it's probably, um, I mean, we already kind of ruled out oxalic acid because it said that the acid is supposed to be liquid at room temperature, but this is another way we can rule it out because it has two, PKA, two pKa's, which means that it's a polyprotic acid, and just based on the curve, it doesn't look like it is one. All right, then it says, based on the titration curve, the student proposed that the unknown acid has one COOH group and a molecular weight between 85 and 92. And that's what I was saying before. That, you know, you can just look at the curve and if it only has one of these, uh, like, sigmoid shapes, then you're just going to know that it's monoprotic. Okay. So, um, on the new MCAT, you're probably most likely to see a polyprotic acid. Um, and they like to throw in some biochemistry there and do it with, like, you know... Um, any of the amino acids, the 20 amino acids, are actually polyprotic because they have that COOH group that can be ionized, and they also have that NH3 group that can be ionized, right? So, um, you know, you're more likely to see that, but if you understand how to do this problem, then you'll be able to apply that to anything else you see, all right? So let's get started. So it says... A comparison of which two compounds from table one best shows the effect of molecular weight alone on melting point. All right, so melting point is going to be um, affected by many properties of the chemical, but this question is specifically asking for just molecular weight. And we know that if you increase the molecular weight, you're going to increase the melting point. It's going to be more difficult to melt the substance, okay? So... We, we, what we want to control for is um, hydrogen bonds because that's one thing that really contributes to high melting points. If something, if, an, if a certain molecule can make a lot of hydrogen bonds, then it's going to increase the melting point. And we don't want to, we don't want that to be a confounding factor in this specific question, right? We just want to have, we want to control for that. So the two compounds we want to pick should have, should be able to make the same amount of hydrogen bonds and only differ and how big they are, right? So if we look at our table right here, we so we're going to throw out oxalic acid, right? Because that can make two. So it has two carboxyl groups. So we're going to be looking between these three right here. Okay, and just based on, you just want to try to control for as much things as possible. And because of that, the two most similar acids that differ in weights, and they differ in weights because of the addition of a methyl group. 
would probably be propionoic acid and uh, butyric acid. So we're going to go with C. All right. Before titrating with NaOH, what was the approximate H3O plus aqueous concentration of the solution containing the unknown acid? Okay. So if you remember the H3O plus concentration, um, if you just take the negative log of that, you get the pH, right? So if we can see, if we can find out what the pH was of the solution before the titration, then we can work backwards and get the H3O plus concentration. So we're going to go to our titration curve, and we're going to look at before we add even a drop of NaOH, which would be at this y-intercept right here, you're around pH 3, let's say. You don't have to be that exact. The MCAT will put sufficient space between each answer choice, so it's, you know, you will... If you know how to do the problem correctly, you will get the right answer. So let's say 3, okay? So if 3 is equal to negative log of H3O+, plus, you move over the negative sign, you do 10 to the negative 3, and that, that should be your answer for H3O+, plus, right? So which one of these is 10 to the negative 3? It looks like A, right? That's the close to that 1, 2, 3. Okay, so let's move on. Question 46 says, The student prepared a 0.1 molar aqueous solution of cratonic acid, and a 0.1 molar aqueous solution of oxalic acid, then adjusted the pH to each, four, each to 4.7 by adding NaOH. Which solution has a lower freezing point? Okay, so freezing point is one of those things that also it's, you know, there are equations that you can use for it, you can find equations online, but conceptually, basically, if you have, you know what, you can even think about this in terms of like what you already know um, about solutions. So for instance, if you have a salty solution, so if you have two glasses of water, one is salty and one is pure distilled water, which one has the lowest freezing point? So, you know, ask yourself that, which one have the lowest freezing point? And it's going to be the one that has the most solutes in it, right? And the reason for that is because when there are solutes in there, it's going to be harder to get the water molecules into that crystal formation to, you know, allow it to freeze. Um, those solutes are going to be interrupting that, that uh, crystalline structure that's required for freezing. So, um, and we know this because, you know, just from experience, if you live somewhere cold, I don't, I live in Los Angeles, so we don't, we don't ever do this. But, um, out in the East Coast, in the Northeast, uh, if there's a snowy day and you want to, you know, you got to clear the roads, they're really icy, what we do, we usually pour salt in it or some sort of salt solution because that lowers the freezing point, um, which essentially makes it melt, right, at whatever temperature, um, the, the ambient temp temperature outside. So, um, so we're going to try to use this, use this, use this, what we like that. There are a lot of other things that contribute to it. But for the MCAT, mostly just think about concentration. The higher the concentration, the lower the freezing point. All right. So let's see. Uh, let's look at our answer choices. All right. So A says the cratonic acid solution because it contains a lower molar concentration of solid particles. I mean, no, that's not true. Um, because if it had a lower concentration, then it wouldn't have a lower freezing point, right? So it's not A. B, the cratonic acid solution, because it contains a greater percent mass of solute. Does it? Greater percent mass. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure that's the correct answer. Okay, so let's look at choice C. The, oxalic, the oxalic acid, and sometimes you're going to see answer choices where you're kind of like, what? Um, so you just move on and then look for the best answer because usually it'll it'll be very clear which answer is correct, especially in the science sections. So let's look at C. The oxalic acid solution, because it contains a greater molar concentration of solid, solid particles. So let's see. At 4.7, okay, at 4.7, oxalic acid, one of its carboxyl groups is going to be completely ionized, right? Because we're above 3.14. So we're above this number right here. This carboxyl is going to be completely ionized, so we're going to have a lot of H plus in solution. 
And at 4.7, you're going to have, you know, some, not a lot, but you will have some um, ionization of the second carboxyl group. At 4.77, you would have half and half, right? That's the uh, half stoichiometric point, you know, if you think back to your uh, general chemistry. If you're at pH is equal to pKa, half of your solutes are going to be ionized, the other half are not. Um, so oxalic acid is going to have a good amount of H plus in solution at, at 4.7. Let's look at uh, crotonic acid. So crotonic acid, the pKa is 4.69. So that will be fully ionized as well. But you have to take into account the fact that oxalic has two carboxyl groups that can ionize. And one is completely, and one is, and the other is partially, but you know, if you add those two together, it's going to be higher than that one from crotonic. So um, oxalic acid is definitely going to have a, a higher molar concentration of solute particles, more H plus in solution. Um, that's going to lower the freezing point. So that's going to be the right answer. All right, 47. During the titration summarized in figure one, the concentration of RCOOH equaled the concentration of RCOO minus when the pH approximately equaled which of the following? Note that R is this hydrocarbon. So this is what we're talking about before. This is the half equivalence point. And this is a very, there are only really two important points in every titration curve. It's going to be the half equivalence point, which is halfway from the equivalent. So the equivalence point is that point at which the curve is nearly vertical, okay? So since this is experimental data, you're not gonna really get that vertical of a slope, but it's gonna be somewhere around here, okay? And that's when your moles of acid are equal to the moles of base added. So however much moles of acid you started with, if you add that much, that many moles of base, considering that it's, you know, a monoprotic acid, then you're gonna, you're gonna have, you have already um, ionized every single molecule of acid and you're done. And that's why the pH is very sensitive. So if you add a little bit more base, you're just going to get a jump in pH, right? And so this is the equivalence point right here. And that's, I don't know, let's say like uh, 26 milliliters. So if we go to around 13 milliliters, somewhere around here, right, that would be our half equivalence point. Um, and our, at our half equivalence point, we have a perfect buffer, right? So that's um, when you plus or minus plus or minus one pH unit, you have a buffer, which means that you're gonna have when I, if you if you add a lot of acid, that acid is gonna be soaked up by the conjugate base. If you add a lot of base, that base will be soaked up by the acid, right? And um, a buffer systems are really important. In the human body, we have lots of buffer systems in our blood. Um, the biggest one I think I can think of is the bicarbonate buffer system, and that keeps our pH in our blood around 7.4, which is really important because, as you know, um, proteins will get denatured if they're out of their pH range. Right? Their interactions are different; they won't be able to catalyze things as they usually can, and that's going to be a big problem. Right? So buffers are very important. Um, buffer the ideal buffer region is found at the half equivalence point, right? So that'd be around here. Okay, so that's gonna be at pH, let's say like four something. Okay, a little bit over four. Um, and that's obviously equal to the pKa, right? So um, that's probably, yeah, somewhere around there, right? Four, four point something. Okay, so um, like I said, the MCAT's not gonna give you numbers. They're not gonna give you like 4.7 and 4.8 because it's obviously impossible to determine, right? They're going to be something that's reasonable. Um, and we said around 4, so 4.8 looks like the closest answer. All right. OK, 48. The student rejected crotonic acid as a possible identity of the unknown acid because crotonic acid is what? One, a strong acid. It's not, right? If it, if it were a strong acid, we wouldn't have had a pKa for it. So. Or if, we, if it were a strong acid, the pKa would be negative, or a very, very small number. So that's, that's definitely in weak acid region. Um, it's insoluble in H2O. I mean, insoluble, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, it, 
it has a carboxyl group, I wouldn't say that it would be insoluble, right? It has lots of interactions to make with water. Okay. Um, and then C, it is solid at room temperature. That's true. Remember, we that's what we talked about earlier in the problem. Um, that cratonic has a melting point of 71.6, and that's definitely um, above 20 degrees Celsius, which would mean that it is solid. So we can throw that one out. 